All right, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining our webinar today. We're going to talk about Hobo data loggers being used for stream and wetlands hydrology. All right, and so I am your host, Taryn Picard. I'm the Global Product Marketing Manager here at Onsa Computer, and I have been focused on selling Hobo data loggers in my previous role as the sales manager here at Onset. So I absolutely love joining these webinars and being able to uh, talk to our customers about the different applications they have and different reasons for using our loggers. So quickly, let me go over a little bit of the webinar details with you. Our goal is to run for about approximately 55 minutes and try to save a few minutes at the end for questions. But if you have questions during the webinar, feel free to go ahead and type them into the questions section over on the right hand side of your screen. And I will do my best to answer them for you. This webinar is being recorded and no worries, we will share a link with you after the fact so you can rewatch this webinar if you're interested. So a little bit about Onset, who we are and what we do. We are the home of the Hobo Data Loggers. We're located actually on Cape Cod in Massachusetts, and that is where we do all our designing and manufacturing of our loggers. Uh, we focus only on monitoring products. That is what we do here at Onset, and that is what we're uh, good at doing. We have a global network of distributors, so our data loggers are used around the world. And we are ISO 9001-2015 certified. We also focus on lean manufacturing, so they're doing, we're doing the best we can to make sure you get a high quality product um, without taking a whole lot of extra steps. And we have been doing this for over 40 years. So today's presenter is Andrew Thompson, and I'm very excited to introduce Andrew to all of you. He has been assisting researchers and consultants and government agencies, helping them find the best data loggers for their water quality and environmental monitoring needs. So with that, Andrew, I will turn it over to you. Awesome, thank you, Taryn, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, Taryn mentioned, and, and I will definitely agree, that one of the best parts of my job is being able to hear about all the different types of applications and really the different ways that our customers use these Hobo data loggers in these applications. Um, one that's very common that comes up often, uh, you know, for some of our water level solutions is stream and wetlands hydrology monitoring whether it be wetlands restoration work, stream restoration work, uh, mitigation banking. Uh, this is a, a really common application that comes up and I, I felt it was a good one to share some of the insight um, about the kind of data loggers that we use in these environments. Uh, so for today's agenda, um, we'll walk through an overview of the different water level solutions that Onset provides. Um, and then we'll get really more into the meat of the presentation, which is a detailed look at the U20 and U20L optical USB water level loggers. The reason um, I have selected these ones is because they are most commonly used in these wetlands and stream applications where you have so many wells and they're uh, a, a very affordable and economical solution uh, for these environments. We'll get into really the start to finish process, uh, which begins with configuring your loggers uh, through the desktop software. Um, the deployment methods and mounting methods for your data loggers, offloading that data in the field, and then uh, processing the data right through our Hoboware Pro software. And then at the, the end of the presentation, we'll uh, do a quick overview of some of the different water quality parameters that Onset offers, and then also some of the climate monitoring solutions that might go hand in hand uh, with these solutions. Uh, to kick things off, I, it's it's two o'clock post lunch, so hopefully I don't put anyone to sleep uh, during this hour webinar. But I'll kick it off with a poll question to wake everyone up, um, and the question is: Are you currently using water level data loggers? And I'll let Taryn take it from here for the poll question. Excellent, thank you, Andrew. I just launched that. Uh, poll and I see a whole lot of people are using our loggers already so this is very exciting excellent excellent some people are not using loggers at all at the moment and then there are a few that are using other brands that's okay we're excited that you're here to join us today and I think you'll be happy with using hobo data loggers in the future all right so I'm closing out the poll here and I'm just going to share the results so there you go 75 percent of the attendees during this webinar today are already using hobo data loggers excellent that's awesome. All right, Andrew, back over to you. 
Great for you for those of you that are using Hobo data loggers. Um, hopefully, uh, we you know getting into more of the desktop software and the config the configurations. Uh, you can get maybe some things that or learn some new things that you hadn't before. Um, so with that, let me start the presentation here. All right, so I, I want to kick things off with just to put some context uh, to, you know, using data loggers in these types of environments. This is a nice quote here uh, to start it off by saying, Hyd hydrological monitoring in a wetland environment involves observing and recording water levels across the site with a view to using the data to understand how the wetland hydrology functions. So uh, with, you know, Hobo data loggers, we look to monitor uh, water levels in these uh, wetlands or stream environments to get that hydrology and see how it functions. Uh, with Hobo data loggers, we have a range of non-vented style transducers, and as data loggers, they provide that long-term monitoring need um, so that you can collect that historical data and look at those trends over time. When you're using non-vented transducers, uh, you're going to get a couple different measurements here, uh, one being absolute pressure and that's with the, the pressure sensor or, or uh, pressure transducer that will be in the well. You'll get an absolute pressure reading and temperature. Um, and then typically there's an additional barometric pressure uh, logger that you'll use. It's, it, we actually use the same uh, pressure transducer for barometric pressure as well. Um, and that will be involved in this process. And our software will then turn that data into something more meaningful, which is water level. It does some of that post-processing for you. So one of the, the first questions I like to ask uh, when a customer is looking to do some data logging, uh, in this case, uh, maybe water level, I like to ask how they like to, or how they want to collect their data. Um, we offer three main styles of collecting your data and for water level and, and other parameters as well. Um, one being web-based remote monitoring solution that gives you the ability to have cellular, Wi-Fi, or ethernet uh, telemetry to get that data remotely uh, right through our cloud-based platform so that you can see that near real-time data. Then we offer um, a Bluetooth solution as well, which if you are going to the site, and I know with, with a lot of the wetland restoration projects, um, you know they have to go to the site every four or six months to kind of see the, the vegetation and the growth of the vegetation. So if you are still attending the site, the Bluetooth is still a, a nice convenient way to do all of that process right on site. You can configure, deploy, and offload your loggers right through our free Hobo Connect app. So it's a nice convenient way if you are still going to that site and you don't need something that's remote um, and, and giving you that near real-time data. Then the ones that we'll talk about, um, we'll talk about more so today is the Optic USB loggers that we have uh, that work with our desktop software. These are a really easy to use and affordable solution. Uh, they do require that desktop connection to configure them, um, but offloading, I'll show you a way to you know, use the shuttle and only the shuttle while you're on site. So we'll start things off by talking about web-based uh, remote monitoring solutions. Uh, we have two main solutions here. We have the RX2100 station and the RX3000 station. Uh, both of them provide water level and, and a range of other parameters that we'll talk about. Uh, they're both uh, set up, you know, I'll talk about the RX2100. It's a nice, small, compact station. Uh, it, it provides cellular coverage to push that data right to our cloud uh, and give communication to the web. And it has a nice built-in 1.7 watt solar panel to recharge those batteries that will last, you know, up to five years. And uh, at that point, you can just buy a rechargeable battery pack to continue on. With these stations, and similar to how the Bluetooth works as well, it's built in in, in kind of three pieces for water level, um, and it goes along with our non-vented style. So you have the micro RX here, or the RX21 station. The station itself will provide a barometric pressure reading. So you have the station, uh, the barometric pressure that's built into it. You have a direct read cable um, that is connected to the pressure sensor that is giving you that absolute pressure. And our software uh, will do that calculation for you to give you a water level reading. Um, and also for the web-based solution, we also have calculations for flow monitoring, but I uh, have another slide that I can talk about that a little further. With the RX2100, along with water level, 
it has five inputs for some of our smart sensors. Um, we have a range of different smart sensor options. They're plug and play sensors, and you can do various parameters such as you know temperature and relative humidity, wind speed and direction. Um, you could even put a rain gauge on here. That's a very common one if you're looking to correlate water levels uh, with rainfall totals. So you can add up to five of those inputs right here with the micro RX along with doing water level. For the RX 3000 station, this is a little bit more of a robust station uh, and it's flexible as well. There's, you know, everything on this station is plug and play. Uh, it also has the ability to do not only cellular, but it also does ethernet and Wi-Fi connection as well. Um, and again, pushes that data right to our cloud for that near real time access. The, where the RX-21 station had those five inputs for some climate sensors, the RX-3000 has uh, up to 10 plug and play inputs uh, for some of those sensors as well. And, and there's others beyond uh, climate. You can do pulse inputs, um, you know, analog inputs uh, right through the smart sensor port. The RX-3000 also has the availability for two modules, which is what kind of separates it a little bit from the RX-2100. Those two modules can do a range of things. Um, you could do two water level setups. So if you were looking to do maybe a groundwater well and then alongside it maybe a surface water well or a surface water um, level measurement, you can do two of those. If you had two wells that were spread apart, um, you could run cable to both of those uh, wells and, and get two measurements from the RX3000. It also has, we also offer other modules such as analog modules, uh, relay modules, if you were looking to maybe turn pumps on or off or open and close that, that relay. For the analog module, this is going to, it's a four channel analog module and you can take various inputs. Maybe if you're looking at, you know, third party water quality sensors, for example, if you wanted to see maybe the conductivity at a location or the dissolved oxygen, uh, you can take that voltage or you know, four to 20 milliamp input that are very common with those types of sensors, the station will actually, in, in that module, will actually give it excitation power. And then you can scale those readings right through our software. So for dissolved oxygen, you can um, put meaning to it by turning it into milligrams per liter, for example. Now, with the uh, remote stations, the RX stations, we the, the data is pushed right to our cloud-based platform, which is hobolink.com. Uh, you can create customized dashboards here. It's pretty interactive. Uh, you can make them visually pleasing uh, for yourself or even if you wanted to share that data with others. We give the ability to create this dashboard and use it as a public URL. Uh, so if you have a client that wants to see the data but you still want to house everything and keep that login information, you can share it as a public URL same thing is if there's a community that wants to be involved and, and see the data coming in, you can create a dashboard for yourself, you can create a dashboard to share. Um, so we give the ability for that with the uh, Hobolink dashboards. And then with the Hobolink and, and you know the remote access piece of it, and, and with it being right through a web browser, you can do this right through your smartphone, you can do it through your laptop or desktop and see this data coming in uh, near real time. This is a big one, uh, and I think one of the, the major benefits of, of having a Hobo Link system or a remote solution is the remote alarm notifications. And there's various ways that you can set them up. Um, you can set up text message or email notifications or alarms. Um, say you were looking at you know, high water levels or low water levels, high or low temperatures, you can scale them as well, but you can set up you know, an alarm to be triggered and a text message to be sent if a temperature went above a certain threshold or if a water level went above a certain threshold. The other great piece of what the remote capability and the alarms bring is that if something does happen on site and using one of these stations, if something does happen on site, you can address it at that time because you are getting notified that either a system went down or, you know, there's a there's battery problem. Uh, it missed a connection. These types of things are pushed to you directly at the time they are triggered. Um, so that way, you know, when you do go to site, uh, some of the some of the options now where you go to the site and you collect your data, if there was something to be a problem, this actually notifies you beforehand so you can address it before you get there. And then uh, a lot of our customers will export that data. 
Uh, although you can view everything right through HoboLink, you can export that data as well right through Excel, CSV, or even if you like using our desktop software, you can export it through uh, as a HoboWare file as well. Um, you can set up automatic data delivery. So if you wanted to create maybe um, an automatic export uh, with an Excel file and see the last seven days of data and have it pushed to your email, you can set that up right through HoboLink. Um, and then we also have the ability to integrate with other software. Right now we have, you know, seamless integration with Weather Underground or, you know, Aquarius platforms. So that has seamless integration, but uh, we are open to also using our REST API to integrate into other platforms as well. So now to talk a little bit about the flow monitoring, um, and, and this kind of goes hand in hand with the uh, calculations for our non-vented transducers and the barometric pressure. Our software will do these calculations for you. So for the RX station, we've built in a, uh, a flow calculation. Uh, you know, if you have a wear or a flume uh, in a specific setup, you can punch in those uh, parameters right here, and we'll actually give you that um, as a parameter that you can look or you can see on your dashboard. You don't have to go and post-process this data through a third-party software to get flow measurements. You can see your stage, you can see your flow. Um, we provide that ability right through hobolink.com. And then also with, you know, with wares or flumes, if you have a stage discharge uh, table already in place, maybe it's a stream location uh, that you had one of these, or you know, maybe there was a USGS gauge at, at some point along the lines and they have a stage discharge table, you can enter those uh, parameters or you can enter those data points in here as well. And in turn, it will also give you a flow measurement that you can then in turn put on your dashboard. And last but not least, uh, we offer the map view. Um, if you have, you know, multiple stations and multiple locations, instead of kind of, or instead of going to different dashboards and, and trying to locate each one, we have this map view so that you can go in, you can hover over and, and click on the actual uh, station that you're looking at and see those current conditions. So it makes it just a little bit more convenient um, and seeing what's going on with these stations. So now over to our Bluetooth enabled data loggers um, or data logger for uh, the MX2001, which uh, this is a great water level solution. And it's built similar to how the RX2100 and RX3000 are built, where it's it's kind of three main pieces here. You see the top end, uh, which is your, your logger housing, um, your Bluetooth connection, but it also provides that barometric pressure as well. Um, and same thing through our Hobo Connect software, it's going to do that calculation and provide it in terms of water level for you. So you have the top end here, um, then you have your direct read cable, uh, which is really just connecting it to the sensor end with those uh, read cables. And this is a, a very similar Kevlar cable to what we have for the RX2100 and 3000. Um, you can have a custom cable length up to 500 meters. For these wetlands and, and stream sites, that's usually not necessary. But if you were to do two wells, and you, you know maybe for the remote solution, the RX3000, if you want to do two wells, you could run up to 500 meters of cable uh, to locate both of those wells. And then you have the absolute pressure sensor down here, which comes in both stainless uh, steel and titanium, and uh, pressure ratings from 13, 30, 100, and 250 feet. Um, as far as how the Bluetooth works, you have that, you know, Hobo Connect app, and I'll get into that a little bit further, but this is a nice illustration down here of someone using the Hobo app. When you are within that Bluetooth range, which is typically about 100 feet line of sight, um, you can connect right up to that app or connect up to that logger and configure everything right on site, offload it on site, so that you don't have to actually access the well and pull everything out. Um, this is also nice because it shows a, a very common setup, which is like a two inch PVC stilling well, for example. Um, and this is how you would want to deploy one of these Bluetooth loggers in that stilling well. You see the pressure sensor down here um, in an area where, you know, water level is not going to get below the sensor. Um, if it does, it's not going to damage the sensor by any means, but it's not going to provide you with uh, proper readings. And then you get a, a cable length that's enough to really fit the size of the well so that this top portion is never submerged. Um, and, it, you know, that is going to be your Bluetooth connection, but it also shouldn't be submerged uh, for barometric pressure and also because the electronic components. 
And then you can cap it off. Uh, we offer a two inch well cap, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, we have this for all of our uh, loggers, really. You can use this one for the U20s, um, the, the USB offload loggers. You can use, uh, we have one for the RX2100 and 3000 station as well. It's a nice well cap. It suspends everything in here nicely and um, you can cap it off, lock it, make sure nothing's getting inside of the well. So with the Hobo Connect app, as I mentioned, this is this is a free download. Um, when you are within range of these loggers, there's no pairing required. Everything's going to populate right up on the main screen here on your app, uh, your iOS or Android device. Um, if you're within range of multiple loggers at the same time, they can all pop up here. Uh, we can talk about offloading in a moment, but um, everything pops up. And the first step is really to, you know, select your device and go through that configuration process. So uh, what you'll do is you'll tap the device that you want to connect with um, and you'll configure your logger with uh, all of these, you know, requirements here. So you, you, you can name your product. Maybe it's dependent on the well. Um, you want to set your logging interval, um, which can be anywhere from, you know, one second to 18 hours. Very common. Uh, interval is somewhere maybe in the along the lines of 10 to 15 minutes. That will typically give you months of data um, and also has enough to kind of see a nice flowing graph. Um, so you could set this to, you know, 15 minute intervals. And then once you do that, you'll actually see the logging duration change. It's going to tell you that, you know, with this many samples at this amount of time, you can get this much uh, or this length of time data out of it. Um, here you see one minute will give you 24 days. If you change that to 10 to 15 minutes, you'll get months of data. And last but not least here, the starting uh, is where how you start the log. You can either start it to start it now, um, or you can set it for a future date. If you wanted to start it, you know, tomorrow at this time or, you know, later on in, in that current day. With the water level side, um, we want to enter our reference level. And this is really how uh, how everything starts and it's calibrated is by entering that reference level in at the beginning of your deployment. Um, so you'll take a reference level measurement, uh, you'll punch it in right here, uh, whether it's meters or feet that you're looking at, and then also what kind of density you're working with for the environment. Uh, maybe it's it's a freshwater wetland or you know a salt marsh, you would punch that in here. We also have the ability for freshwater adjusted for temp, which I suggest if you are in those types of applications. Um, and then you would save that down. Once you've deployed your loggers um, and you, you come back to your site, they've been logging for months uh, and you wanna see that data. Uh, again, if you're within range of multiple loggers at the same time, we actually just recently came out with a feature where you can actually download those loggers all at once. Um, you can do a kind of a bulk offload. Uh, which is great. It saves down the file and you can open these files to kind of see a little inter interactive graph here uh, to look at your points. I think, yep, okay. So you can look at your points here and, and it, it is interactive. You can export this data as well, um, whether it's Excel, CSV, or again, you can export it as a hobo file if you like using that platform and using some of those capabilities. If the graph looks, you know, kind of the way you want it, you can export it as a PNG file as well. So now to talk more about um, really the, ma the main topic today, which is the optic USB pressure transducers. Um, and again, the reason we're going to talk about these more for you know stream and wetlands hydrology is when you're looking at hydrology, typically there isn't just one well. Um, there's many wells to kind of look at a, a location, again, whether it's for restoration work um, or mitigation banking, you're looking at many of these wells. And so these become the most economical solution. Uh, there's also a need to actually attend the site uh, to check vegetation and for other purposes. So these are a great solution. Um, and as far as how they are set up, we have the U20L series logger uh, and the U20 stainless steel and titanium loggers. Uh, both of them are, again, non-vented for hassle-free deployment. There's no you know, cleaning of vent tubes. Uh, these are really bulletproof solutions. And then also for your barometric pressure, um, we have, you can use the 13 foot rated transducer that we have. You don't have to purchase an additional uh, barometric or designated barometric pressure logger. You can just use the same logger for that purpose. 
Logging intervals um, can go from anywhere from one second to 18 hours. Again, the most common I hear is about 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, and both of them include temperature. For the U20 uh, style loggers, these are, um, you, the, the U20 stainless steel version is $550, I believe, and the titanium $650. These are really rugged solutions, um, gr a little bit smaller in size too. If you're working with like a, a one inch well, um, these are going to fit inside that one inch well where these would not, typically it is two inch uh, wells, so the, both of them aren't an issue, but these are a little bit smaller in size and will fit in those one inch wells, um, but highly accurate at a hundredth of a foot. Um, it comes with a three-point NIST traceable calibration certificate. And unlike the U20L series, it has a 250-foot rated transducer. Because of the, the price on these, uh, we, off, we offer the option to have a battery replacement uh, for, I believe, $150. You can send these in um, and have the batteries replaced. Both of them have a five-year battery life, uh, five plus years really, I've heard them going uh, well beyond that sometimes, depending on your logging interval um, in the environment. But you can get a battery replacement, and in many cases, these are still in great condition, and sensor drift is very minimal for pressure trans, or these pressure transducers, uh, so that's a great option to kind of extend your lifespan for these loggers. On the U20L, which um, have become a big hit, again, because of how many wells and just really how economical they are, uh, these are $330, uh, but still highly accurate at, you know, 0.1% full scale, which is, you know, 0 0.013 feet of water. So still very accurate. It comes in a polypropylene housing uh, for use in both fresh and salt water environments. So just to talk a little bit about some of the features and benefits of our HoboWare software, I won't get too far into it because uh, a lot of the presentation actually involves HoboWare and we'll see some different screenshots, but you have the simple menus uh, for fast and easy logger setup and readout. Um, you know, you get those presentation quality graphs and you have the ability to export, you know, text, CSV or Excel formats. Um, and then you get, you know, different plotting tools and in timestamp tools, or if you're looking to, uh, you know, take sections of that data, uh, we have some of those abilities through the uh, graph function. And not only that, but we also have, similar to what you saw for, you know, the HoboLink with some of the calculations or data assistance that we offer, the HoboWare software has uh, built-in data assistance so that you don't have to post-process that data, again, outside of the software. When we talk about water level, um, in non-vented transducers, we have a data assistant built into the software so that you can, you know, upload your, your barometric pressure file and it will do the calculation for you and, and provide it in terms of, you know, what's more meaningful, which is water level. Um, so again, being able to do that inside of HoboWare uh, is, is a benefit for sure. With the U20 style loggers um, being the Optic USB platform, we offer two different ways to really configure and offload your loggers. Uh, we have the waterproof shuttle and the base station. Um, the base station, I'll talk about that one first, uh, requires kind of direct connection to your, your laptop or desktop that's running the software. Um, so on the configuration side, you know, you'd hook up your logger right to the coupler. The other side, you'd hook the USB into your, your laptop or, or desktop and you would configure that logger. And the same thing with the offload, you would one by one offload them onto your desktop software. However, um, it does provide you know, a quick, efficient process for offloading, uh, being able to offload a logger in you know, 30 seconds or less. On the waterproof shuttle side, and, and this is normally one that I would highly suggest for applications that have many wells, many loggers being used, the waterproof shuttle for a small increase in cost uh, has internal memory for that offload while you're on site and doing those deployments. This allows you to, you know, leave your laptop at at the truck or or back in the office so that you don't have to bring all of that equipment on site and offload them. You know, with the wetland restoration sites and in the stream sites, these are usually longer term deployments. Um, so you're not bringing them back to the office at a sh at, after a short deployment. So it's better to, to go with a, a waterproof shuttle where it can hold up to 64 full loggers. Uh, so you can one by one go to each well, offload that logger onto the shuttle, 
um, and then dump it all at once off into our software following um, your offload. The waterproof shuttle is also waterproof up to 20 meters for um, you know underwater deployments. So now we can start to talk a little bit about you know that start to finish process uh, of of using these data loggers in some of these sites. Uh, your first step is is configuring your loggers. So uh, you can see up here this is actually one of the the U20Ls. Um, what you would do is you would first name name the product. Um, it, it automatically gives you the serial number there. But I would highly recommend um, you know, identifying your logger at this point, especially if it was a barometric pressure logger, for example, you might want to make note of that here so that when you are offloading the data, um, you can recognize it easily and use that for uh, the other uh, pressure transducers. I'll give you a ser serial number, um, the amount of deployments, and then also your battery state, um, which it's important to note here for your battery state. Uh, we talked about the battery life for these U20s being five plus years. Um, I have customers sometimes come to us that they're on their sixth year, um, the battery life's at 80%. Does that mean you know I still have 80% of time remaining on it? These are lithium batteries, so they don't um, kind of drain in a linear fashion. Uh, so if you are at that fifth or sixth year or seventh year of your deployment, and you do find that it has dropped kind of below that 100%, if the data is that important, I would uh, I would suggest addressing it at that time um, to ensure that you come back to a logger that has data on it. Then your next set uh, section here is your your sensors. Um, these are these are really your channels and what you're going to see for data. So uh, in most most cases here, you're always going to select absolute pressure and temperature, especially if you're getting density derived from temperature. Um, and then you have a the ability for filters over here, which what that is, is it gives you the option to have separate channels or other channels, added channels. Um, if you were looking at maybe min and max temperatures for a day or hourly, um, that can be a separate channel that you select and it will provide that measurement in the data. And then lastly here is your deployment section. So uh, you wanna add your logging interval. Again, 10 to 15 minutes is, is a very common logging interval for some of these applications. You can see here with the U20Ls for 30 minutes and you know 21,000 measurements, you're going to get you know just over a year of data. That means at 15 minutes, you'll get you know almost a half a year of data for you to get back to the site and still offload without it overwriting some um, or stopping. And then your start logging time. Um, this is an important part of the process as well. If you have many wells, um, you want to kind of set these loggers. I would say set these loggers to a time and date that are all at the same. They all start at the same time, and they start at a time that you know they'll actually be deployed. Because when we come back later and, and enter that reference point in, we're going to need to select a point from, from the data logger that it was actually started. So once you get this all set up and you, you click your delayed start here, uh, it brings us to our, our next step. And that next step is uh, deploying your loggers in the field. And this is a little bit more on kind of the mounting side of things. Uh, these are common types of setups that I find in, you know, wetland restoration projects, uh, stream projects. You see, one of the most common methods of deployment would probably be a two inch PVC stilling well, um, where you would see slotted PVC below grade, standard PVC above. Um, and we offer this, you know, we talked about the well cap. We offer this well cap to cap off not just two inch PVC, but two inch pipe in general. Um, it has a, a nice removable disc here. So as you can see, if, if your cable suspended, you have a, a logger at the bottom. If you pull this, if you pull that cable out um, and dropped it inside of the well, that could uh, be a potential for some time lost for sure. Uh, so we have this nice well cap that has a removable disc so that if you did pull it um, and, and let go, it would drop right on top, but it also ensures that you're keeping everything at the same height that it was previously. Um, so that's a great, uh, nice little well cap to cap off some of these more common two inch PVC stilling wells. In this line here too, we offer stainless cable and crimps. Um, I hear of customers using fishing line uh, to suspend them as well. For Barometric pressure, um, you want to put that logger in an area that's really just shaded and vented. 
Um, you can keep it inside one of the wells uh, as long as it's not going to be submerged. Once it is, it's really just giving you absolute pressure. It's not doing the barometric. So you want to put it in a location that um, is, is vented, shaded, and you are going to find, I, I know customers that will put them maybe in trees or, or bushes, uh, as long as you can access them when you come back because it is important information. With the groundwater wells that you see here, uh, you know, that might not be as common uh, for stream applications. I can, I definitely have customers that, you know, will punch in some rebar and strap a, a PVC well to that to keep it stable. So it still is uh, fairly common, but you can also, um, if you're looking to do something that's maybe more, uh, it's, it's not as visible uh, as a well and you're putting it in a stream, you can see here, there's a, you know, a cinder block with a piece of PVC that has the, uh, you know, the holes drilled in it to get flow through the sensor. Ultimately, at the end of the day, you want this to be stable. You want the pressure transducer to be located in a spot where it's not going to move up or down, side to side, um, because when you do that, you are uh, kind of changing it, its calibration a bit and, and ruining that process. So you just want to make sure it is stable um, and, and, again, for moving up and down or side to side. Once you have, um, you know, mounted or, or set up your mounting, created your well, um, and you deployed your logger, you suspended it inside that well, we will then take a reference level measurement. Um, and this is an important part for the processing of your data, because this is what's really calibrating your logger and telling you where you started, um, which is necessary for these non-vented style transducers. So, Common, commonly, we have uh, customers using a water level meter, sounder, beeper, there's different names for it, um, where you you'd kind of drop that beeper down in the well, um, it beeps once it hits water and you get, uh, and you can get your reading um, or stage, current stage at that point. Um, what you want to do is jot down that level, you want to jot down the time and date in your field book because you're going to use that measurement later on in the process, which could be months from now. So you wanna make sure you hold on to that field book or put it in a safe spot um, or even recreate it maybe on a laptop following your, your deployment. It's, it's important to know too that the reference measurement is what you want to reference the level to. Again, these are non-vented transducers. So really it's taking just the differential between barometric and absolute pressure. So if you're looking at you know a groundwater well or a wetland um, site, you can reference it. I have a lot of customers that reference it to the ground level. So, you know, if you had, if if you're taking a reference measurement and the current water level is a foot below ground surface, you would punch that in as negative one feet because you're referencing it to that ground level. If you're doing a surface water application, uh, like a stream, you could reference it to the top of the well casing or maybe the stream bank. Um, again, it's what you want to reference it to, and that's where your data is going to start off. Um, and when you're kind of looking at it from a graph view and, and using um, these non-vented style transducers. Once you've deployed your loggers, uh, they've been out there and collecting data, it's time to come back and, and collect that data. Again, you leave them out there for months at a time. You come back and do a, a data collection. This is the process more or less with one of the data shuttles. Um, the next screen actually shows a little bit more on the base station side and what that process looks like. But for a, a data shuttle, um, you know, it's, it's really quick and easy with this optical USB interface. You pull the loggers from the well, um, you can clean them off, and then you attach that shuttle or, or base station uh, to the logger via the coupler that it comes with. And you know, for all of our water quality and, and level solutions, uh, we have this base station shuttle and coupler set up and it'll come with all those different couplers that you need. Once the logger has been secured and in the shuttle um, and attached to it, uh, you can momentarily press the lever on the side of the coupler and this will bring up an amber LED light that will blink continuously uh, while that process, while that is in progress. Um, once it reads it out, which it is a quick process, I believe under you know 60 seconds, after that it's read out, the shuttle will sync the logger with its internal clock. Um, and the shuttle is 
has most recently been attached to a computer at that point. So that's why it's syncing it with its internal clock and it's gonna relaunch it with its original settings. And when I say original settings, that means the settings that you preset. So ultimately it's um, launching it with a fresh memory. And then once that's complete, the LED will blink uh, green for success so that you know that you can redeploy your logger. And when you do redeploy your logger, it's now time to take a reference level measurement that you will use for the next uh, time you collect data and offload that data through the Hoboware Pro software. So this is a little view of what reading out the loggers um, looks like in, in the Hoboware Pro software. Um, I showed the process of the shuttle. This is more of what it looks like if you were to use a base station. You can see here a, a U-20L uh, kind of pops up when it's connected to the desktop with your, uh, with your base station. And what you're gonna do is one by one with the base station, offload that data onto the software. You're gonna save those files down in a spot that you can grab them easily. Um, and, and again, if you had not done this prior, uh, you know, if you know which ones your barometric pressure file is, just make sure that it's easily recognizable for kind of the next step in the process, um, which is using the barometric pressure assistant. Um, if you are using a shuttle and offloading that data in the field, at this point, and which makes it, again, much more convenient, it's not a one by one process. You have all the files that you can download at one time that populate because they're all uh, on the, the hard drive of that uh, USB shuttle. So the first step in kind of processing a water level, um, water level data file is you would have your you know absolute pressure transducer let's take one of the wells for example um, you have one of the pressure transducers that would be inside the well and your first step because in the in the beginning all you can really get is an absolute pressure uh, reading and then a temperature reading those are the two options available for your for your different data points to do the barometer you need to do the barometric pressure data assistant to include those two measurements and also to calculate water level. So this is what the barometric pressure data assistant looks like. Um, you go in here and, and select your density, again, fresh water, salt water, derived from temperature. Um, you would select that here and then you would check off using a reference water level. You would punch in what that water level was uh, that you had um, jotted down in your field book. Uh, with the reference level, we talked about you know being a foot below ground level, you would punch in here negative one feet, and then you would select your reference time. Uh, this is really, the drop down gives you a whole list of all the data points that um, had happened during the deployment. And again, this is why it's important when you are deploying those loggers or you're configuring those loggers to have them start at a time that, you know, when you took a reference level, it actually took a data point as well, or was close enough to it. And then once, uh, you finish this step for the reference level, it asks for uh, a barometric data file, and you would select uh, from the ones that you had saved down, you would select that data file, upload it um, here, and it will do that calculation for you. Um, it's good to use a barometric pressure logger because you know during storm events where the barometric can change, uh, this will actually account for that and show nice smooth data as opposed to if you were using a constant barometric pressure or just using the reference level and absolute pressure, um, you could see during those times maybe a spike in data. Um, and, but you do see that we have the option to use a constant barometric pressure or um, if you're using a reference water level, uh, there's no need to enter that in. So now once you've done the barometric pressure data assistant, uh, you now have the ability to see absolute pressure temperature, absolute pressure barometric, uh, this is your barometric file here, you can see that data as well. And then also uh, you'll now get a water level reading. So again, you're not having to post process this data and do this calculation outside of our software, we do it for you. Um, and at this point, this is where you would plot that data. So this is what the Hoboware software looks like um, when you are actually graphing that data. It's a nice interactive graph. You can see in the top here, it has all of your data points, um, almost looks like an Excel format here. It has your timestamp and then all the different uh, parameters that you have monitored. 
uh, you can at this point, and you could do it on the pass screen as well, you can deselect some of these. You know, if you don't really care to see barometric, if you don't care to see absolute pressure, you just want to see water level, um, you can deselect them over here on the left-hand side. And then, you know, it, where I said it's interactive, you can you can zoom into different parts of this graph. You can kind of uh, cut out little stamps of, of what you want to see, what's applicable to you. You can change the type of graph, you know, a bar graph. Uh, so it, it is interactive. Um, and you can export this data as well. If you wanted to pull it off and, and kind of do other things with it, uh, you can export it as an XLS or an Excel file, a CSV, or even a text file. Um, one of the things, you know, when you're using many of these wells, um, or you have several pressure transducers or loggers that you're using, you can merge these data files uh, together so that you can see all that data or the important data on one graph here so that you can then turn around and print that off. Um, once you've once you've kind of offloaded your, your U20, um, you've created this file or, or you've gone through the barometric pressure data assistant process. You now have this file. This is now a project file. It's no longer just a data file. It's a project file because you've done that process. And at this point, you can go in on the top left. It gives you the option to merge data files. You can now add in, um, you, you go through the same process, but you can add in new project files to kind of merge that data and see it all on one graph. Which that actually brings us uh, a little bit quicker than I thought maybe. That that brought us to uh, the end of kind of that process and using those U20s in these, you know, kind of applications for water level monitoring. Uh, it brings us to our second poll question, which is, you know, in addition to water level, are there other parameters that you're interested in monitoring? All right, well, I just launched that poll. And we'll give everybody a second here to put in their results. Looks like a lot of people are also interested in monitoring water quality. I'll let that run for one more second here, and then I will close out the poll. Okay. There's right. a good mix here of water quality and weather parameters and soil conditions, so that's good. All right, let me share those results with everyone. So it looks like water quality definitely is the win here, but uh, certainly weather parameters are also very important for a lot of people on the webinar with us today. Excellent. All right, back over to you. All right. So we're going to finish things off here, just kind of going through some of the options that Onset offers beyond just water level. Um, that can be applicable to these sites um, or other applications that maybe you're involved in. Um, for the water quality side, we offer a range of different temperature solutions. What you're seeing here is one of our, uh, it's become one of our best sellers of, of the Bluetooth logger, and I'll talk about that one in a moment. But, you know, with water level, we had remote-based solutions, we had Bluetooth solutions, and then we also had the optical USB-style loggers. It's the same with temperature as well. Um, we offer, you know, plug and place temperature sensors that you could use with some of those RX stations. Uh, we offer Bluetooth style temperature loggers, uh, whether it's for water or even uh, climate parameters. And then we offer the USB style that, you know, have been around for many years, um, the tried and true. This is this is a, a nice Bluetooth logger uh, that we came out with recently. It's you know, highly accurate at, you know, below a, a quarter degree Celsius. Um, it has, it'll give you 96,000 measurements. It has great battery life, uh, which is between three to five years, depending on um, if Bluetooth is always on or on um, for water detection feature. It also uh, has user replaceable batteries. So, you know, once the item or, or once it's the battery life has drained, you can replace those and continue to log that data. Um, it has, what's unique about this logger, and really I think one of the only ones for our water temperature side, it has the ability to provide water detection. So it has these two screws on the front that look for the conductivity of water. Um, when it is submerged or when it is out of water, it will actually point to that in the data. So you can you know, easily filter that data instead of looking for your temperature spikes um, and kind of filtering through it, it does that for you and you can easily uh, format it that way.
Along with temperature, we also have uh, conductivity and salinity measurements. Uh, we offer two loggers. We offer a freshwater conductivity logger, and then we also offer a you know uh, full seawater for salinity and conductivity measurements. Um, the you know saltwater conductivity logger will get up to 55,000 microsiemens per centimeter, um, which is typical for saltwater applications. This is on our optical USB platform, so similar to the U20s, uses our desktop software, um, and hopefully in the near future, this will also be in our Bluetooth platform, along with the DO logger here, which uh, now is also on our optical USB interface with the desktop software. Um, these are these are great solutions, been around for a long time, um, and also, again, everything we offer is really a data logger, uh, so it's going to give you those historicals. Um, and they're all economical. So, you know, if you're really looking to spread the range um, at a location, these are great solutions to do that and get those long-term trends. Then we have the pH logger here to kind of wrap up the water quality measurements. Uh, this is our, our Bluetooth pH logger, gives you that Bluetooth convenience where you can configure everything, deploy it and offload it right on site. Uh, even the calibration process is done right through our free app. So it makes it nice and convenient. You can do that uh, on the site as opposed to kind of doing it beforehand. And last but not least, we have light level as well. This is a Bluetooth uh, pendant temperature and light level data logger. If you're interested in light levels, I know these are popular for, you know, uh, seagrass studies, eelgrass studies, um, and it will give you that temperature measurement as well. And then beyond kind of water quality, and there's a range of data loggers that we offer just beyond these two. You know, we, we kind of cover both aquatic, terrestrial, um, and indoor building performance uh, measurements. But uh, for more of what's applicable to maybe wetlands and stream environments, uh, we have the water quality parameters and then also some of these measurements here. Soil moisture is an interesting one. We actually just recently came out with a Bluetooth soil moisture and temperature uh, data logger. This is, um, and I could see this actually being used. I've I've talked to some customers that do you know wetland mitigation banking and and on the delineation side maybe um, using this to actually see what your moisture content content is around one of those sites because um, I know that's that's sometimes part of the process is seeing what kind of moisture there is. This is a Bluetooth soil moisture data logger, which I think is the first of its kind. Um, but we also have you know, remote-based solutions for soil moisture and USB offload as well through some of our stations. So this right here is a nice uh, multi-depth uh, remote solution that hooks up with our RX2100 or RX3000 station. Um, so you can get, you know, a real clear picture uh, with this multi-depth sensor as well. And then you have uh, rainfall here. This I would say is one of the most common uh, to pair with water levels, uh, just when you're looking to correlate that data uh, between rainfall totals and, and the current levels at that time. This is a standalone uh, US, well, optic USB. It has a little pen, pendant uh, pulse logger inside of here, so you can offload it the same way with the shuttle of the base station. And it can act as a standalone device um, where you can get rainfall totals on the site. Um, but we also have options of this for the Bluetooth uh, sorry, not Bluetooth, the um, RX stations as well for remote monitoring. These we have the plug and play rainfall uh, or the plug and play rain gauge that can plug right into those RX 2100 or 3000 stations. Temperature and relative humidity is another common one. And for these, we, um, you know, we kind of hit all the different uh, forms of, of data collection, which uh, this is a nice Bluetooth temp RH sensor uh, that you use right through the app. This is a uh, plug and play smart sensor for our temp RH, which can be plugged into, you know, whether it's a USB uh, station that we offer or one of those RX stations that provides that remote data. Um, we have the temp RH kind of covered in all those areas as well. And then last uh, but not least, the wind speed and direction sensor. Uh, right here, you're going to see these two as, uh, as the plug and play smart sensor as well. This will go into our RX stations um, or even our USB micro stations that you can offload that data um, when you're on site. And with that, um, we will, I believe, open things up for questions. 
All right, sounds good, Andrew. So we've had lots of questions and I will apologize because some of them are way too technical for me. So if I did not respond to you, I'm gonna tell you now it's because I didn't know the answer to your question and I will look That's into okay. it and we will we will certainly follow up with some folks. Um, so a couple of things, uh, questions came up and I did the best I could to answer them, but if you don't mind talking a little bit more about the Bluetooth communication and kind of just going through how it doesn't, that does not mean it communicates through water. I, and I know you touched on this Good and point, um, yeah. I just think it's something that you could certainly touch on again based on some of the questions we've had. Absolutely, yeah. So, you know, it depends on which loggers you're using, but if you're looking at the water level solution, um, where that top portion of the MX2001, the Bluetooth water level setup there, that top portion can never be submerged. So you'll be able to access that logger at all times. When it comes to maybe, your, you know, the Bluetooth temperature loggers and using, you know, the app, those temperature loggers that can be submerged um, and you kind of leave them in these stream environments, when you walk up to them, you're not going to be able to get them uh, through water, essentially. It, it's really a line of sight connection, which we say is a hundred feet line of sight. Um, it can penetrate through certain items, but water is, is typically not one of them. Excellent, thank you, Andrew. Um, and I don't know if you know this one, but I didn't know the answer to it, so I'll, I'll openly admit that. But do uh, the reference water level measurements have to be taken immediately after deployment, or can they be taken at any time during deployment? So typically, I suggest taking them at the beginning of a deployment, but ultimately, the data, the the software will correct for it whether it's at the beginning or the end of your deployment. So um, it will, you know, if you take it at the end, it will actually correct for it uh, backwards. Uh, if you take it at the beginning, I I say take it at the beginning because it, it kind of, you, you're following that same process. And then when you come back to collect your data and you're going to redeploy your loggers, you're then again taking your reference level measurement. But if you um, had failed to maybe take that reference level measurement at the beginning of your deployment, yes, take one at the end and it will correct backwards. Excellent. Thank you, Andrew. So lots of other questions rolling in here, um, but maybe you could talk a little bit about our weather stations because I have a couple of different questions coming in about the ARX, uh, micro ARX station and the built-in barometric pressure sensor. You want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, so with, with the different stations that we offer, I mean, we offer those remote base solutions, the RX-2100, the RX-3000, those were the two that we kind of went over today. We also offer um, a U-30 and an H-21 USB station. Those are uh, the non-remote USB style that are very similar. Uh, the H-21 has those five plug-and-play inputs. Uh, the U-30 has up to 10 and then also gives you some of those module um, options. But with those stations and, and the different climate parameters that we have, we didn't we didn't touch on it in here but we do offer you know a wireless platform where you can have some of those you know temp sensors or temp rh sensors um, rainfall wind speed and direction on our wireless platform network which um, may be a whole nother you know webinar to to discuss but uh, we have a great wireless solution for those as well um, with what we talked about today it's really all those plug and play um, smart you know the smart sensors that we offer for these different stations when it comes to the built-in barometric pressure, um, let's just say you're going to build a water level station and a climate station or a MET station, um, you wouldn't necessarily need a separate barometric pressure sensor because it's already built into that water level module setup. Uh, right at the module, we have a barometric pressure sensor and that's how we kind of derive um, our water level readings through the software. Hopefully that answers that, but if not, um, we can always follow up with you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Andrew. And for the sake of time, I'm going to wrap things up. We have tons and tons and tons of questions coming in. So I want to thank everyone for being active participants. I will also say a lot of your questions are probably great to reach out and speak with our technical support reps because a lot of questions have to do with uh, loggers you may already have. So I just want to remind everyone we do have technical support available from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So please feel free to reach out if you're having trouble setting up your logger um, or if you have some questions about how to uh, best take care of your logger. There's some questions around maintenance. Um, and also we, we have a ton of resources available on our website. So uh, please feel free to check that out as well. But we are going to save all of these wonderful questions. We will have some sales application specialists 
reach back out to everyone, make sure we get answers to those questions. Um, but if you are looking specifically for assistance with technical, technical support, I would, again, encourage you to reach out to us sooner rather than later, because I don't want to leave anybody stranded without getting the data they need for their uh, project. Awesome. Thank you again, everyone, for joining the webinar today. And thank you, Taryn, for hosting it. All right. Sounds great. Great job, Andrew. And thanks, everyone. Have a great day.